now everybody knows each other. All right, so here's how the, uh, the rest of the morning is going to go. Um, I have about a half hour where I'm going to go through 40 years of ocean color. Then we're going to take a break and have a snack, uh, get some fresh air. Lorraine will give you a history of atmospheric science. Then we'll conclude the morning with a brief history of the PACE mission, and then we'll take a lunch break, after which we'll come back, and that'll be get your notebooks out, or if you choose to take notes, and you know, we'll dive into some of the algorithms in science and uh, radiative transfer. So we thought that the science part of this should be preceded by the history lesson um, for two reasons. One, you're young, uh, and, <laughs> and two, uh, this is a mixed crowd. So we're about 50-50 atmospheric science and ocean color science. And so placing the context of the magnificent being that is the PACE Observatory, you do actually benefit from knowing uh, where it came from. So mine is uh, not too technical, but it's intended just to give you the journey since uh, uh, it, there's really been a lot of evolution of ocean color over really 40-ish years. Um, it's going to be, again, not to overuse the term, but drinking from a fire hose because it's quick. So digest what you can. I'm going to race through it a little bit. Uh, if you happen to know anything about horse racing, that's just uh, Pimlico. It's one of the three triple crowned. Uh, events that happens in Baltimore, which doesn't mean anything, just needed something that made it clear that I was going to go fast. All right, so the reason for being for ocean color are these guys. These are microscopic marine algae, plants, and bacteria known as phytoplankton. They come in all different shapes and sizes. They all have different nutritional values. They prefer certain conditions, so they're changing in space and time. And generally speaking, if you like breathing and you like eating, then you care about phytoplankton, even if you're not in view of the ocean. So why phytoplankton and why satellites? That'll be part one of three. All right, so I already mentioned this. Uh, what I haven't mentioned before is the role that phytoplankton play in the carbon cycle. And so Ivana can uh, regale you with tales of this later in the week, and she will. But the general thing you need to be aware of is that they operate a lot like land plants in the sense that they convert inorganic carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and ocean into cellular material. So they really cook the carbon and they all cook the carbon a little bit differently. So it is important to keep track of them, uh, particularly since their distributions are changing in space and time. And generally speaking right now I'm talking about the beneficial phytoplankton. So for context, they're very, very small. I think a can of Diet Coke probably has an order of 10 million cells in it. So we're looking at one coccolithophore being uh, 0.01 milliliters, about 1,000 cells per milliliter. And yet, uh, off the Celtic Sea, you can see massive blooms of these things from space. So just try to wrap your head around how many are actually in that stretch of body of water. So this is the easiest of all the phytoplankton to detect from space. Now I could ask you two other questions here. Uh, do you like clean drinking water? Do you like shellfish that doesn't poison you? And if the answer to those two questions are yes, then chances are you also care about harmful bacteria and phytoplankton. And really uh, the point here is, is that many phytoplankton are beneficial, but there are those out there that want to kill you. So we track those as well. So what you're looking at here is uh, a satellite image in true color of the western part of Lake Erie. Great Lakes. Um, that is a microcystin containing cyanobacteria. That is the water intake for the city of Toledo. And so you might imagine not wanting that harmful bacteria to be outside your drinking water. And I can tell you that was uh, maybe 10 years ago, but they actually had a citywide ban on using the water for showering, cooking, anything like that. And this is bad for your pets too. Of course, there are also problems elsewhere, and they can create um, agnoxic conditions, which relate to fish kills. Sorry. So phytoplankton clearly now are your new best friends, and you would want to really have a strong understanding of their distributions. So I can tell you uh, from experience as someone who has had an office with no windows for 23 years that at one point, every oceanographer wants to go into the field and study the ocean. They don't all end up locked in an office looking at the world from space. But in the next three slides, we'll just 
in a kind of joking kind of way, talk to you why you need satellites, that you just can't sample everywhere at all times. And the first is collecting water here sucks. Collecting water there sucks. And then my favorite. Uh, there are autonomous vehicles out there that are really, really cool. Uh, there are also curious creatures. <laughs> all right. So we all want to go in the field. It's got its perils. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, and then last, um, just to give you, so that's Baltimore many, 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 many years ago. But when, when you think about the 71% of the world covered with water, um, it's hard to get context of how big the ocean really is, particularly since it's in three dimensions. So North Chesapeake Bay, Mid-Atlantic Bite, North Atlantic, North America. So it's the world's a big place. And so nobody is ever suggesting that you replace field sampling with satellites. We're suggesting that there are really good complements to each other. And that one really shouldn't exist without the other at this point. And there are questions you can answer with satellites you cannot answer when you measure in the field, but there are a ton of measurements that you can't answer with satellites. You need both. So we're going from microscopes to telescopes here. I'm changing the terminology for the non-ocean color crowd here. I've been using phytoplankton over and over, but we're going to change it to chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a photosynthetic pigment that is ubiquitous in all land plants and all phytoplankton. And because of that, we can use it as a metric for phytoplankton abundance. So when I'm talking about phytoplankton now, I'm really going to be referring to chlorophyll A in particular, which comes in the concentration of micrograms per liter or uh, milligrams per meter cubed but it's a concentration of a photosynthetic pigment. All right, this is Ocean Colors Moon Landing. What you're looking at is Global Biosphere. It is a compilation of CWIS, MODIS, and VIRS, which we'll talk about in a second, which are three satellites that have generally overlapped with each other over 20 years. So moving to land really quickly, the color should be pretty self-explanatory. White is ice, the forests are green, the deserts are brown. The switch in color bar to chlorophyll is a little bit different. So the deserts now are in the purples, like in the South Pacific gyre there, you can see purple pulsing. Uh, the really dark blues. The forests are the light blues, greens, and reds that you see. Uh, North Atlantic, for example, North Pacific, you can see these explosions in certain times of year. That's when the forests of the ocean are suddenly developing. Um, but again, this is all a concentration of a singular photo photosynthetic pigment. And then the reds are the really, really dense concentrations, and that's usually associated with a massive phytoplankton bloom or a river, you know, putting uh, suspended sediments that seed uh, phytoplankton blooms offshore. But the beauty of something like this, frankly, is that you take 20 years of data, you compress your senses, you go into orbit, and now you're watching the Earth breathe. And there are very, very, very few things like this out there where you can actually see the evolution of your home planet changing. And so you can see the deserts actually expanding with time if you know where to work. So the ocean deserts are actually getting bigger. You can see the intensity of the blooms changing with time. You can see ice coming farther down in the early part of the animation and not so far in the later part of the animation. But I, I call it the moon landing because this is basically the seminal contribution of the ocean color community at, up to this point. But remember, we're only talking about a total abundance right now. We're not talking about different species. We're just simply saying we can see this pigment. Okay. Phytoplankton are important. You love them. How did we get here? Well, it started with aircraft in the late 60s and early 70s. This is a science paper that came out in 1970 that was pretty much the seed for satellite ocean color. And what it revealed is that the percent of incident light, which is your y-axis here, 
as a function of wavelength, and you're looking at blue light to red light in this case on your x-axis, changes as a function of the volume of chlorophyll in the water. Okay, so what's that basically saying is there is a relationship between light or color to what's actually in the water. This is where we're going to use another term now that I've overused already, but ocean color. Literally, we're looking at the color of the ocean. All right, so then in the 80s, they conducted a series of ship-based campaigns that helped quantify this relationship. So in this case, on the x-axis here, you're looking at a pigment concentration. Again, this is chlorophyll plus a few other pigments as a function of different wavelengths, a water-leaving radiance, the spectrum of light coming out of the water at one particular wavelength. You can see there are some relationships that have formed here with some bands, but not so much others. But the real revelation that started ocean color from space was that if you take a ratio of a blue band to a green band, there is a strong relationship with chlorophyll concentration. What this means then, if I can measure light at two wavelengths, the right two wavelengths, coming out of the ocean, ignoring everything else, then I can relate that to a chlorophyll concentration. Again, this is uh, work done in the early 80s, and I will point out you're going to see the name Howard Gordon a lot. Um, he's actually a physicist from the retired from the University of Miami, not particularly a seagoing oceanographer, but totally revolutionized our field and was one of the first to bridge the gap between um, atmospheric physics and ocean color. So this was successful enough, we got to the coastal, go coastal zone color scanner. 1978 to 1986, it flew on the Nimbus series of satellites. It was a Nimbus 7. Um, this was total proof of concept, meaning it was not an operational instrument. It was, let's see if we can actually do what they did from aircraft from space. So it only had four primary ocean bands, um, blue, two green, and a red. It's whole reason for being was two data products. Uh, the sum of chlorophyll A and some other pho photosynthetic pigments and then a diffuse attenuation coefficient. And I'm sorry if the terminology, don't worry deeply about the terminology of Ping Wang this afternoon is going to really take a deep dive into all of that. But the things that are important to point out here is that it was discontinuous operations. So what that means is it kind of just took snapshots every day over the globe. It wasn't like what you might be used to now where you're seeing the whole globe every day. And it tilted. So why do you think an ocean color instrument tilts? Any ideas? Exactly. So you can't see color through specular reflection off of sun glint. So what this instrument did was tilt away from the sun while the sun was in front of it, and then tilted away from the sun after it crossed the subsolar point. And it did it in increments of two degrees, but they settled on 20 degrees as being the most effective for that. Um, digitization was eight bits, just so you can follow along and see uh, how things improved over time. So we're talking about the water leaving signal from the ocean, but in reality, the satellite can't see that by itself it is looking at the total signal that's coming from the top of the atmosphere. And so this is just a cartoon that illustrates all of the other things that get into the way. And again, we'll take a very deep dive into this this afternoon, but really just want to point out that it is, the signal is the sum of the water leaving signal that we care about, plus other things on the sea surface like sea foam and white caps that are reflecting light, plus anything going on in the atmosphere you know, clouds getting in the way, aerosol cloud interactions, scattering by aerosol particles, all of that. So we have to remove a ton of the signal to actually get to the water leaving signal that we care about. And what you're looking at here then is a function of wavelength all the way into the near, uh, shortwave infrared, the total fraction of the total signal observed at the top of the atmosphere. The water leaving signal is the green line at the bottom. And so this is the real take home message for the challenge of ocean color, is that you care about something that is 10% of what the instrument is actually measuring. So 90% of this is noise, unless you're Brian or Lorraine, in which case it's their reason for being, which is great that we're now working together on all of that. So we have a atmospheric correction problem. 
And the term atmospheric correction is that ocean color wants to correct the total signal to remove the atmosphere. And so the question became, at the time, how did you extract the ocean leaving signal that is so very small from the total signal if you don't know anything about the atmosphere in front of you? And really there are three approaches. The black pixel assumption, which we'll talk about a little bit more, um, and then empirical line fitting and full radiative transfer modeling. At the time, uh, number one was the choice. And this is where Howard Gordon came in and did some really fantastic modeling here. What the black pixel assumption really means is that uh, the water leaving signal can be close to zero, negligible, in certain parts of the spectrum. So if we go back sorry, here, what you can see is that there's a green signal in the, sorry, the green line has a signal in the blue and green bands here. But as you start looking at the longer wavelengths here, there's really no signal coming from the ocean. So if you have a sensor that's designed to measure in the blue and green part, as well as the near infrared and the short wave infrared, then you can assume, this is where the assumption comes in, that the ocean is black at those wavelengths from 800 and beyond. So a black pixel. There's no signal from the ocean. You remove that from your equation, and you can attribute everything else to the atmosphere, in which case you can continue the process. Um, we're going to have a talk on this on Wednesday, right? So we'll, we'll get a little bit farther into it. But the point is, is that um, the atmospheric community didn't actually believe this could be done. And Howard and others, Andre Morel, um, kept pushing it forward, uh, conducted field campaigns, and demonstrated that it is actually possible. The community semi-converged, and uh, there you go. So this was originally work done in the 80s, early, early, early 80s. But Howard just published a paper that recounts all of this. If it's something that you're interested in, you can get the entire history. And frankly, this revolutionized science for the oceanographic community, because it is the first time they were able to construct views of biology from space in a way that can never be measured in the field. And so this is a slide from a talk I gave a number of years ago where they invited all the Nimbus program managers back to have a 50th anniversary celebration, you know, because that program was 60s and 70s. And I brought my textbook and was just like, hey, you gave me a career. This is the image that you created by doing all of this. Um, and it is unbelievable the discoveries that have been realized since then but not possible without satellites. So then you get to the gold standard CWIFs. Still the gold standard, despite what anybody else is going to tell you, this is still the gold standard for ocean color. Um, and there's a good reasons for that I'll get to. You'll notice that it added wavelengths, shown in red there, so farther towards the ultraviolet and then farther into the near infrared for atmospheric correction. Um, it was two-day global coverage at most of its resolution. So now we're starting to see the globe every day. It continued to tilt. Um, its digitization got better, and it came up with the concept of time, de time delay integration, or TDI, which uh, one of our OCI engineers will explain on uh, Tuesday, tomorrow. But it is a basically an engineering tool to boost the signal. So you went from a CZCS era into something, you know, kind of a, um, a Yugo into a Cadillac at this point. It also was the advent of lunar calibration and system vicarious calibration, which are two critical on-orbit activities we'll talk about on Friday. Uh, Backpixel assumption was revisited. This was the uh, golden era of the emergence of spectral inversion modeling and coupled ocean atmosphere retrievals for our community and all different other kinds of corrections. So CWIFS really was um, what kicked off everything in terms of building this community into something that became international. Product suite expanded as well too, carbon. And just a couple of the papers here, you know, it was the first time we were actually able to observe an El Nino transition from space. There were productivity algorithms that gave a different kind of view of how phytoplankton communities were changing on global scales over time. And you can actually start measuring these deserts coming and going as well. Okay, so then MODIS launches, and MODIS is a fantastic instrument for a lot of good reasons, but it is an ocean color capable instrument. It is not an ocean color instrument. The reason is it does not tilt. 
And so you are losing huge swaths of the ocean every day. On two day average, you are losing 17 million kilometers of ocean due to sun glint that you would recover if you tilted. For context, that's the size of roughly South America every two days. And if you start thinking about where you might find sun glint, it is, of course, in the tropics. Where does El Nino happen? It's in the tropics. And so amazing discoveries for MODIS, but I'm setting the stage for why a tilt mechanism was added to the ocean color instrument for PACE. And when you see it, you'll realize how big of an engineering challenge that was. CWIS is about this big. Tilting that's no big deal. MODIS is the, uh, sorry, uh, OCI is the size of this. <laughs> oh. But there were great things about MODIS. There continue to be great things about MODIS. They added a fluorescence channel, which is great because now we can do things like evaluate fluorescence quantum yield from phytoplankton stressors and so forth. Um, it also added shortwave infrared bands, which was spectacular for the aerosol and cloud community, but also really beneficial for the ocean community because they are farther to the right, longer wavelengths, and they can be used for atmospheric correction. And so when that black pixel assumption starts to fail, these bands became very, very val valuable. And of course, uh, you know, the quality of the imagery continued to improve. Nods to our international collaborators that are doing some really inventive things. Um, SGLI from the Japanese Space Agency and Olchi from the uh, uh, Copernicus suite of uh, UMETSAT NISA. You'll note that they are expanding the suite of wavelengths even farther, which is fantastic. You'll notice that their footprint is suddenly shrinking from a kilometer to something smaller than that. So this is where one of the first trades comes out of here, which we'll learn about more tomorrow as well. Detectors per band, haven't really talked about that yet. You'll note CZCS and effectively CWIFs had one science pixel per band, which meant you're only calibrating one detector. When you get to MODIS, you have 10 detectors. Now this is still, a, there's two different kinds of satellite instruments, which we'll talk about, but suddenly with 10 detectors, even though the technology was the same, you have effectively 10 different instruments for a really, really dark ocean. And you start seeing stripes in the imagery. When you move over to SGLA and Olchi, they're push broom instruments. So they operate a lot like your cell phone does. They have millions of detectors. And the beauty of that is that they can collect far more photons than those other, those other technologies. And so when you can collect more photons, you can shrink your pixel size at the cost of image quality. So put a pin in that, we'll talk more, but those instruments are pretty fantastic. So where are we going? Well, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have some sense of that. Um, this is the uh, Darwin Eco model that comes out of Woods Hole. And it is similar in a way to the biosphere we showed you before, but this time you're not looking at total chlorophyll abundance. You are looking at four different phytoplankton species. And the prediction in this model of how they're evolving and changing with time. We're not good at this from space yet, but this is where the promise of pace comes in. We want to move from that biosphere you saw into something like this with real observations, or at least observations from an instrument like PACE assimilated into other Earth system models. Uh, shout out to the International Ocean Color Coordinating Group. If you want to learn more about anything in ocean color, it is a fantastic resource, including a history lesson on all the missions and instruments. But where we're going, the global hyperspectral. You're going to learn all about that this week. Uh, geostationary instruments, polar imagery, you'll learn all about this week. CubeSats, we'll touch on a little bit. High spatial resolution, getting into 10 meter, sub 10 meter footprints. LIDAR, probably won't touch on a whole lot, but it's the future. Um, and a lot of this we'll go through in a lecture I'll give tomorrow morning. So with that, you land on pace. You're gonna learn all about that. Uh, it's mission history in a few minutes. Just wanna point out, um, broad brush here that it is what we're calling hyperspectral. That term can mean a lot of different things, different people. What, how we're going to be using it is that it, you're going away from single channel detectors that are cherry picked discontinuously across the spectrum into a continuous measurement from ultraviolet into the near infrared. Anyway, it, you'll notice that it's a single science pixel. So we're reverting back to that. It's going to tilt. 
The trade, as you'll learn, is that we had to revert back to one global kilometer for all of this. But anyway, you're going to learn a lot about that. And of course, this is because we want to get to all the things that we can't see with conventional ocean color instruments or ocean color capable instruments. So just as kind of a concluding thought here, those are six different phytoplankton absorption spectra. The gray dash lines are where VIRS collects data. And you'll notice a lot of the interesting stuff happens in between them. And that's what we're trying to get to. All right, we have two amazing polarimeters that we're so grateful for. You will learn a lot. <laughs> one of them, you know, might be near and dear to a few hearts in here. Um, you'll learn a lot about that too. And looking forward, just to wrap this up, there are projects out there that are dealing with some of the things that I mentioned. There is geostationary instrument uh, being built for a collaboration with you know, UNH and NASA Goddard called Glimmer and a look at the US um, central area of the Gulf of Mexico and some of the coasts. NOAA as an agency is moving towards geostationary on their weather satellites. Korean Space Agency has one. So the nice thing about that is you start looking at temporal variations and changes in different kinds of ways. Right now, with these polar orbiters like CWIS, MODIS, and VIRS, and again, we'll talk about polar orbiters later, you might get 10 clear views a month. With a geostationary instrument, you might get three or four good ones a day. CubeSats, small sats, you can see how teeny tiny they are. Uh, it's Alan Holmes holding them in hand, the creator of CWIFs, and then LIDAR adds a vertical dimension to our ocean monitoring capabilities. It's not wide swath, but you might imagine a big wide swath instrument like PACE with a LIDAR beam going straight down. Now suddenly you have a combination of three dimensions that you can, um, can start exploring. Okay, um, cool. I am done. I'm happy to take questions. I will note that one of the godfathers of the field who is retired just published a paper that talked about this entire evolution of ocean color at NASA, uh, Chuck McLean. Um, worth it. If you're interested in such things, please consider checking it out. So, any questions for me? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, probably a little bit more, but not because of anything other than that swath isn't as wide. So what you're going to lose is dependent on how wide your swath is. And um, those push broom instruments, Ulchi in particular, is actually a series of five or six cameras that look down. But it's closer to three-day global coverage than it is to two-day. So being a poor mathematician probably can't do that in my head but it would be on the same scale what's the reason for modern telescopes oh um terrestrial communities aerosol and cloud communities don't want they, they don't benefit from the tilt they actually prefer that it doesn't and since modus and veers are multidisciplinary instruments then you know the decision was made not to tilt it Ruby. Okay, so it is uh, 9.36. Why don't we take a break, coffee, fresh air, donuts, whatever's out there, uh, till 10. And then Lorraine, will, uh, my, uh, my partner in crime here, will get the oceanography out of here and bring in the atmosphere. Oh. <laughs>